Hey everybody, this is Professor H back with another networking video. I know you've been probably feeling kind of left out, thought I forgot about you, but I've been a little busy, been uh, doing some projects, so I thought I'd come back in and tell you a little bit about what's been going on. So, uh, I guess we'll jump right into it here. Uh, I was fooling around the last semester with something called TinyOS, TinySec, and sensors, and so that's what I'll chat with you about today. But we just built a, a small implementation of sensors and uh, put them all together and then so we can get done but I'm going to talk mostly about sensors and what you might do with them and a little bit about how they operate and some of the gear we used so what we did was you know we built uh, the the environment established communications we loaded the software onto the sensors and like that uh, we captured traffic from the sensors you know we, tr we were trying to figure out how the sensors were talking what they were saying what the data patterns looked like and then we uh, turned on an encryption for them, uh, or at least a security suite for them, called TinySec. And then we captured traffic on that network, and then we, you know, we just sort of saw what was happening, and we secured the data from the sensors. Because one of the problems with sensors is that they, they themselves will send out repeated patterns, and then if you've got two sensors that are sensing the same thing, say temperature or light or sound, they might actually send repeated patterns and so you have all of this data that can be captured and then interpreted by by bad guys well here's the gear that we use now these are pictures I'm gonna do a little show and tell at the end here but on the the left hand side there what you're looking at is a mica 2 moat so the sensors are sometimes or the sensor module is called a moat it actually includes the RF communication the battery pack and all that in the middle, you have what's called an MTS 300 sensor board. And on our boards, there are actually a collection of different kinds of sensors there. The big square one in the middle is sound. And then the thing on the right is called a MIB 510 programming interface. And what this guy does is it connects to your laptop. This is an older board, so it had a serial interface to it. And the uh, multi-pronged pin connector, the white thing in the middle, is what you connect your sensor to and or your moat to and then you program it that way. Well TinyOS is an operating system but you can sort of imagine that when you're dealing with sensors you don't have a whole lot of memory, you don't have a whole lot of processing, you don't have a whole lot of storage and so the operating system has to be really really lightweight and that's the fame of TinyOS. So there's just enough operating system to get everything working. So what happens is you program this moat, it has TinyOS on it, and then you install a program that communicates with the sensor board. And then you can modify, you can write your own, things like that. You use that programming board that I showed earlier. And then the communication occurs via whatever RF interface you happen to have. Now these are older MICA 2s, and so they have a radio called a CC100 chip. It's just a chip in the middle of the board. I'll show that to you later on. And it communicates at either 433 megahertz or 866. And it's got a little microprocessor and then that, that white connector board in the middle. And as you can see, we the packets per second, not very high. So there's not a tremendous amount of communication going on here. This is kind of how it works. Uh, this is just two different versions of the same thing, except one is secured. So that's there was no difference uh, between the two physical architectures what happens is in the programming so what happens on the laptop and you push it out to the mica 2 so when you're programming the thing the mica 2 sits down the on the 510 programming board and the sensor board connects onto the mica 2 and the same is true when you were encrypting it well how did we talk to this thing because this uses a programming language called nest c a uh, really lightweight version of C. So uh, we use the SIGWIN interface. So SIGWIN is this mystical, magical environment that will give you a Linux environment on your machine. And you can see this is just a screenshot of my machine. And it works just like uh, Linux, but the really cool thing is that it gives you the environment that you need to talk to the remotes through the sensor board or through the programming interface. And you can run all around your operating system, but in a Linux sort of environment. So it's actually pretty neat if you've never worked with one 
and you can load packages to it the same way that you would in Linux. Pretty slick, pretty nice, easy to work with. So the sensor board itself sits on top of the MICA 2, which is also programmed from the, the 510. What we did is we were looking at, among other things, light data that's transmitted. You can see I've indicated the, the light sensor right there. It's just a little tiny sensor, and you can markedly change what's happening with the light sensor just by passing your hand or your finger over the top of it. And then once you have the sensor data flowing to the MICA 2, uh, modes, what actually happens is that you place a MICA 2 moat on the 510 board and then the other sensors communicate with the MICA 2 moat that's connected to your programming board. So let me say that again. A sensor moat sits on top of the programming interface and it pulls in all the RF communication from the other sensors that are out there and uses the 510 board to send this information to the, um, the laptop. So this is the application that was running on the laptop. And so here we are, see steady state conditions on the left. And then the light signal was interrupted from the different sensors. And you can see the dip in the electricity coming from the optical sensor or the light sensor. For those of you that are really jazzed about this, these are the frames that we dealt with. So TinyOS has a, a packet format, an RF packet format. And then whether you use authenticated mode or encrypted mode, the tiny OS frame is modified as those two are indicated there. So just slight modifications when you start encrypting or we start adding authentication data, like an integrity check or a message check of some kind. This is an example of what raw sensor data looks like. So these are the address fields and the header fields for the sensors themselves. In this case, my sensors were numbered 21, 41, and 61, and that's why in red you see the hexadecimal values that you do. Uh, and then the measurements begin in hex there, 0300, and I just sort of alternated back and forth up top there so you can see what they look like. And then some of the fields are indicated below. Again, if you were really jazzed about this and you want to spend a little bit more time with how the transmissions are actually uh, formatted. So here's the uh, here's the butt in all of this. Micro 2s, Tiny OS, Tiny Sec are really old. We were just futzing around with them and we wanted to see what we could do. But newer sensors work similarly. Today, of course, we have uh, Bluetooth. We have 802.15, 802.15.4, Zigbee. Uh, and the next step in our fool around with these uh, devices will be something called the Iris modes. And they use the much more familiar Bluetooth sort of interface at the lower levels. So we expect them to be much more like some of the sensors or some of the health monitoring devices and things like that that we see today. Well, that'll about do it. Uh, let's do a little show and tell. Hi, guys. As promised, a little show and tell. Now this little guy, let's see if we can zoom right in here. This little guy is the MIB 510. You can see it's got a serial interface right there, DB9, and its own little power supply. And there's my connector board. Whoops, there's my connector board right there. So this is what actually hooks up to uh, the laptop. So when you want to program a moat, so here's our here's our moat. So this is the, let me put this down, uh, this is a MICA 2. So, hey, look at that, battery pack, antenna, okay, and if we zoom in just a little bit, there, right in the middle, there is our C1000 or CC1000 RF chip. Here's our connector, uh, we've got our power switch over here. So what we do is we just take our MICA 2 and plug it right in on the board just like that okay so now what I would do is from the laptop I would shoot my program over and it would program this guy here and I'm all set I have a program loaded onto my MICA 2 well that's great but the MICA 2 is just like most sensor modes it's just a communication device so it doesn't have any ability to sense the environment at this point so what we need to do now take our MTS 
300 sensor board. So same thing, communication stuff, processor on the back, and then here are all of my sensors. And this little guy right here is the one that we spent the most time with. It's our light sensor. So what I would do is I would take my sensor board, Mica 2, and then just sit them right down there on that. Now of course, got to put batteries in it. So I would put batteries in it, and then we'd put several of these in the environment. So we'd have a whole bunch of these guys. You know, plunk, 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 just like that. But it still doesn't do us any good because we, while we have these guys and they're sensing the, the interface, or they're, I'm sorry, they're sensing the environment, right? And they're sending data out. Who are they sending it to? Well, we have to send it to a base station. So this will be programmed with a sensing um, program of some kind. And then we would go back to our 510. And we would have had another one of these guys programmed with something called the base station program. So all of the sensors would be out in the world. Right, I'll back up a little bit here. So all the sensors are out in the world and they're sending data back to the base station, which is, of course, connected to the laptop. And that's how we collected data. So you can have all the piles and piles of these out there. You just change the addressing. All right, so that's kind of how that worked. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but these guys are a little flimsy, just a little flimsy. We got these wires out here. So the next generation was a little bit better than these guys. And here we have it. So this is the Iris 2. We can see we got a little more sturdy um, antenna, and it's shorter because it's higher frequency. And then we've got same stuff. You can see if you can see in there the chips are underneath here. So this guy here will be programmed in much the same way, right? So we've got the the board, but this one here uses a Bluetooth interface. Uh, at least on the wireless side, and so it's just going to be a little different animal, and uh, that's what we're going to be using for the, well, I'll be using for the next set of projects. Well, I'm, why am I doing all this? I've been spending a lot more time with SDN and the Internet of Things, the IoT. So little devices like these guys here are going to be what we use to sense things. This is one example of all of the devices that we're going to find on the Internet of Things, machine-to-machine -machine communication, all that stuff. And so my question is, can I apply some of the principles that we see in SDN to something like this guy here? And then maybe can we extrapolate data uh, to learn something about the environment other than just what the sensors are telling us? Well, that'll about do it. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks for listening. And may your packets or your Bluetooth transmissions always reach their destination.